where she didn't miss a birthday. Kids, uh, she did her job every day as Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Vermont. So I'm somebody who's been on the beneficial side of what medications can do. So that's a good thing. But they're killing us with the price. And they're killing us with the price because they can. And they start out with the protection of patents that enable them essentially to set the price that they want. And they have a monopoly for a period of time. And we would hope that during that time they'd be restrained on the price they, they, can, they, they charge because it's all coming out of taxpayers. It's coming out of businesses that want to have good health care for their employees. And it's coming out of individuals who have to make these horrendous choices about um, mortgaging their house between uh, eating or not and getting that medication. But there's other mechanisms that they're using that are even beyond the monopoly and where during that monopoly price period they have enjoy the power, the legal authority to charge what they want. And you hope they would act with restraint. But even though they don't there, when they get to other tactics to try to maintain that pricing power that they abuse, they do things like abuse the patent system. And that's what we're here to talk about. So you get a, uh, uh, you, uh, we've got some charts here, but we'll talk about Humira, which has been an incredible blockbuster for AbbV. So you get a patent for the invention, right? Well, then you get 166 other patents that are on the color or on the injector or on uh, very minor things that have nothing to do with what fundamentally is the core benefit of the drug. That's the intellectual property. And the reason you get those uh, 166 e extra patents is because you can then make life really difficult for competitors who by law are entitled to come in and provide competition in the marketplace at the end of the life of the original patent. And that Patent thicket abuse, you know, ABV 166, Celgene with Revlimid 117, with Regeneron Bayer 92, creates a enormous burden, expensive burden on the biologics or um, on the generics that want to come into the market and then provide at affordable cost the benefit of modern medicine to people who need it. Uh, and, of course, we've got some examples of the prices here. Uh, comparable countries on the price of Humira, 27, 2800 bucks versus almost 4500 bucks here. The U.S. spends so much more on prescription drugs than the rest of the world. And it's all because we're not standing up for the consumer. And this has nothing to do with attacking the folks who do the intellectual work of coming up with a prescription drug. It has to do with the financial wizards in those companies, that, in the lawyers in those companies who devise these mechanisms uh, to do so much to increase the burden on American taxpayers, American families, and American businesses. And my view is that healthcare is a right, and the biggest threat to access to healthcare for all citizens is the cost of healthcare. And the biggest driver of the cost to healthcare is market abuse by, in many cases, the various players in the system, but nobody does it better when it comes to ripping off the taxpayer, the individual in the businesses, than pharma with the various devices that they use, and patent tickets is the topic today. The legislation that uh, Senator Klobuchar, uh, Senator Braun, and I have uh, would require them, when they have an invention, to only bring up one additional patent in defense of any challenge to the patent that they have. In other words, get rid of the fence, the thicket, the wall, uh, and just litigate on the question of the underlying original patent uh, that they uh, have by legal right, and we don't dispute. We dispute the thicket side of this. So we're 
Uh, so I'm really happy to have everybody here and start building support uh, for this. And we're going to hear initially from uh, two folks who've been working on this, um, incredible <laughs> advocates, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, Sneha Dave. Am I pronouncing it right? Sneha. Sneha. Sneha has been doing this longer than any of us have been working here. Uh, so appreciate that. And also from uh, Jacqueline uh, Garibay. Jacqueline, I'm sorry, right here. Yep, thank you. And then we're going to have this moderated, uh, and uh, that is going to be Andrea. Uh, Andrea Harris will be moderating. So when Senator Klobuchar arrives, we'll interrupt and get a few remarks from her. Uh, but now let me turn it over to Sneha. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. My name is um, Sneha Dave, and I'm from Indiana. And I have lived with ulcerative colitis since I was a little under six years old, which is very similar to Crohn's disease. Most people have heard of that. Um, I have been on high-cost biologics since before I can even remember. Um, I created Generation Patient, which I serve as executive director of, because I realized there was a huge gap for young patients who are navigating and entering adulthood with these lifelong conditions. We are an entirely young adult patient-led staff, and we don't take any private healthcare industry funding, including from the pharmaceutical industry. So when my team and I created Generation Patient, we were really focused on core principles of peer support, um, disease acceptance, disease management. But we quickly realized that there was one key barrier really inhibiting us from thriving into adulthood, and that was access to medicines. We entered the patent reform space because we realized that there was a huge need to have our voices as young adult patients front and center um, within the patent system. I recall a time when I was 11 or 12 years old when I had to inject myself with Humira for the first time. I was so nervous and so shaky because this was a really big pen um, and I ended up misfiring this pen, which means that all the medicine spilled out um, and I remember thinking to myself that this was a few thousand dollar uh, pen that I just had let go to waste. Obtaining a second was incredibly difficult. But I also remember thinking that, um, in questioning myself, how could something that was so life-saving for myself be so incredibly unaffordable? Something that I did not want to take and did not choose to take at 11 or 12 years old. Um, as we've entered the patent reform space, I've realized that there are really useless patents, in our opinion, on things like um, the auto-injector of Humira, the firing mechanism, things that don't really matter to us as patients. Humira was granted a total of 132 patents, of which 90% were granted after Humira was already on the market. Humira's core patent expired in 2016, but we did not see biosimilars since last year in 2023. Patent thicket legislation is a part of ensuring that we don't have to worry about affording our medicines and that we can get access to generics and biosimilars in a timely fashion. As young adult patients, we rely on these therapeutics for a lifetime and we are often navigating financial independence for the first time. We are pursuing our education, navigating work for the first time, developing our identities, all while the potential loss of insurance looms over our head. Um, the physical, emotional, social, and financial toll of such severe complex conditions is clear, yet the life-saving medications that we need are still unaffordable and often inaccessible. This legislation is not just about affordability, but also reforming the patent system is about incentivizing truly novel inventions, which we as young adult patients will rely on for our lifetime. Um, we have often been told that innovation and affordability are mutually exclusive, and we sincerely do not believe that that is true. This bill is a first step toward pro proving the importance of patent reform to ensure that we can afford our life-saving medications while also incentivizing innovation and competition. Over 85% of kids are, uh, with chronic conditions are now surviving past the age of 18. That's a whole generation of patients that are entering the healthcare system. Um, and this patent legislation is incredibly exciting to ensure that 
the generation of patients right now and those to come can have access to our therapeutics for our lifetime. So really great, grateful to Senator Welsh, Klobuchar, and Braun for introducing this legislation. We will really look forward to partnering to ensure that it passes. Thank you. And speaking of, we are now uh, blessed with the arrival of uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar. And all of you know, is there an issue that it matters to working people that Amy Klobuchar is not a leader of? Um, I've got you stumped on that one because the answer is no. And one of the areas where she has been a leader in Congress uh, for years is on affordable prescription drugs. And it's been tremendous to be with my mentor, uh, Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it, we're on five committees together, right? So I feel good about it. I'm not sure about Amy, but uh, <laughs> she can speak for herself. And Amy, thanks so much for uh, uh, co-sponsoring this legislation and all the work you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Amy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter. And yes, we're on five committees. Every single committee we're on together. This gives us huge power when they've double scheduled and we're like, well, we won't be there. There's two of us. Um, but mostly, I just adore Peter for his not just championing incredible causes like this, uh, but also his thoughtfulness, not just um, outwardly, but also behind closed doors when people um, aren't always the same in both places he is, and he's always looking for solutions. And this is clearly something that needs a solution. So I want to thank um, all of you uh, who work in this area, have been affected, your willingness to come forward, and thank you, Peter, for organizing uh, today's panel. Uh, his collaboration with Senator Braun of Indiana um, makes it clear that there is room to move um, and room to go forward uh, when you look at what's happening with the abuse of the patent system right now. Um, I'm sure everything's been said, but as we say in the Senate, I haven't said it. Uh, when it comes to diagnosing the problem, and that is that um, Americans pay the highest prices in the world for prescription medications. Uh, drug prices in the U.S. are more than two and a half times the average prices in industrialized nation of the 25 brand name medications uh, that Medicare spends the most on. Uh, they have tripled on average since the drugs hit the U.S. market, and that's just the beginning. I think it's one of the reasons that we were able to successfully pass our Medicare price uh, negotiation bill. Um, Peter led that bill in the House for years, and I have led it in the Senate. I didn't know he was going to then come over to the Senate, so we've done that together, including leading amicus briefs on this topic. Um, I did not realize I wanted to have more drugs at first, I still do, that are in the negotiation process. I think it is going to help with Medicare, but also really with everyone. But I didn't realize until I um, got started the power of the drugs that already covered just the 10, like Jardians, Genuvia, Eloquence, Xarelto. Okay, I've memorized all of them. Um, because so many people take the drugs. Um, something like Ruth, 9 million seniors, right? Spend how much? Over 3.4 billion in one year on those drugs. Out of pocket. Yes, that's true. So it gives you the sense of what we're talking about here when we look at costs and how they affect people. The other piece of this, of course, is the patent system. And pharma companies are still trying to protect their profits um, in courts, both through the multi-million dollar lawsuits and by building patent thickets. I love that. It sounds like really, really scary. Uh, to block out competition from lower price generic, generic drugs. A New York Times investigation found that gaming the patent system has kept the cost of prescription drugs out of reach for far too many people. Uh, in that report, they found that when big pharma companies assert unnecessary patents to keep generics off the market, and this is a quote from the article, not only is legal trickery rewarded and the public's interest overlooked, but also innovation, the very thing that patents are meant to foster, is undermined. I come from a state that brought the world everything from the pacemaker to the post-it note. Uh, we're a big believer in patents, 
and making patents strong, but we're also a believer in making capitalism work and competition work. Um, and that doesn't happen if people are messing around with the system. Uh, for example, AbbVie filed over 130 additional and duplicative patents on the drug Humira, including on the injector device used to deliver the medication, the injector firing button, and a specific dosage of Humira for a condition that it was already known to treat. The company itself admitted that by asserting these patents against any generic or biosimilar competitor seeking to enter the market, it could tie up competitors in litigation for four to five years. We need a competitive marketplace. I believe in capitalism. I was in the private sector for over a decade representing companies that were actually competing. Um, and when you take that away and you use a legal system that's designed to protect innovation, to just protect your own profits and hurt innovation, then we've got a problem. Senator Welsh's bill is a common sense action that we can take to address Big Pharma's anti-competitive, anti-capitalist behavior. And I'm hopeful that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will agree. They've agreed in the past, Senator Grassley and I did several bills together uh, to promote competition that has come out of the Judiciary Committee on which Senator Welsh and I serve by voice vote. Um, one of the bills stops the pay for delay deals and the other one stops drug companies from filing sham petitions with the FDA in order to stop generic medications from competing with their brand names. I've also called on pharma companies to stop improperly listing patents in the FDA's orange book, a practice that has kept lower priced generics off the market. Um, I will keep working on this, but I gotta say you can't do it alone. And having partners like Peter Welsh, um, who are so forward thinking and willing to cross the Rubicon and figure out how can I work across the aisle to get someone who maybe doesn't agree with me on everything, that is courage. It's not standing by yourself, yelling and giving a speech. Courage is whether or not you're willing to stand next to someone you don't always agree with for the betterment of this country. That is what Peter has done with this work, um, and I'm excited to move forward with him and proud to work with him on this bill. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline Gediby and I'm 22 years old from Austin, Texas and a senior here in DC at George Washington University. I live with AS or ankylosing spondylitis which is an autoimmune disorder that affects the majority of my, my joints and I depend on expensive drugs to prevent my spine and hips from fusing and also to manage my debilitating pain. In the four years since my diagnosis, my doctors have put me on several heavily patented biologic medications, Humira, Cosentix, Embril, Taltz, and Simsia, each one with a price tag ranging from $5,000 to $13,000 a dose, every month, or in some cases, weekly. As a college student, I can reassure you, I do not have that type of money lying around. Um, there have already been times when I've had to forego filling my prescription due to the financial difficulty, which is terrifying. <laughs> Without my medication, I risk losing the ability to walk in my 20s. I should be focusing on things like graduating college in a few months, applying to law school, spending time with my family and friends, and not having to constantly worry about affording my treatment. But affording medication is constantly on my mind because big pharma is abusing the system and taking advantage of patients. By using abusive tactics to prevent mar market competition from life-saving drugs, big drug companies are forcing people like me to pay astronomical prices that they can't afford, but have no choice to pay. At 19, I was prescribed the biologic Humira to treat my AS. Humira is currently the most patented drug in the United States, and as we've discussed before, there is a patent ticket consisting of over 130 patents on Humira. Humira's original patent was approved in 2002, but AbbVie, the pharmaceutical company that makes Humira, has maintained the drug's exclusivity for over 20 years by abusing the patent system. Humira is also the best-selling drug in America, with over $18 billion in, re in revenue in 2022. Another biologic I was prescribed to manage my AS was Enbrel, made by Amgen. Amgen filed for the original patent for Enbrel in 1990, which expired in 2010, 
but Amgen has obtained dozens of new patents on the drug, creating a patent thicket to extend their monopoly until 2037. That's nearly 50 years of market exclusivity. As a patient who has taken these medications for years, I know firsthand the consequences of pharmaceutical companies prioritizing profits over patients' lives. When I was first diagnosed, I almost completely lost the ability to walk. The pain I was experiencing was excruciating, to the point I had to take a leave of absence from my university. At the time, I should have been solely focused on getting better, working on physical therapy, and learning how to cope with the fact that this would be the rest of my life. Instead, I had to have difficult conversations with my parents about how I would be able to afford this lifetime of treatment. High drug prices don't only affect patients, but these costs also burden my family. I'm so thankful for the sacrifices that my family, like financial and otherwise, that my parents have made to ensure my access to medications, but no one should have to make sacrifices like that. Thankfully, Senators Welsh, Klobuchar, and Braun have introduced legislation which aims to limit the number of patents a pharmaceutical company can assert on a drug. This legislation would be life-changing for patients like myself, as it would end big pharma's monopolies on our life-saving medication. With this legislation, I wouldn't have to worry about facing a lifetime of high drug prices and the fear of having to forego my medication to pay tuition, rent, or groceries. Congress needs to put patients' lives ahead of drug industry profits, and I urge the Senate to pass this legislation and continue to advance pro-competition legislation. The future of health and patients like myself depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Welsh, for convening us today. And thank you, Sneha and Jacqueline, for sharing um, your personal experiences and using your voices in service of others. My name is Andrea Harris, and I'm policy director at Protect Our Care, a nonprofit organization dedicated to making high quality, affordable, and equitable health care a right and not a privilege for everyone in America. Protect Our Care was proud to endorse the legislation we're discussing today because it's one of the many policies necessary to rein in drug company greed and make prescription drugs affordable for the American people. The legislation also builds on the momentum generated by the Inflation Reduction Act, which finally gives Medicare the ability to use its leverage to negotiate lower prescription drug prices. And of course, as we heard, Senators Welch and Klobuchar have spent decades of their careers leading that policy, and Protect Our Care is proud to join them on the front lines of taking big drug companies, um, taking them on to lower drug, drug prices. Last week, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services sent the drug companies their first price officer offers in negotiations, and seniors are already seeing the impact of the progress that this law is making, including that this year, for the first time ever, seniors' out-of-pocket costs for brand-name prescription drugs are capped at about $3,300 per year, and next year they'll be capped at $2,000 per year. However, there is more we can do to address one of the biggest cost drivers in high drug prices, which is the lack of competition, stemming in part from patent abuse and anti-competitive conduct. Today we're joined by experts and patient advocates to discuss big drug, drug companies' abuse of the patent system and this bipartisan legislation to crack down on their unscrupulous behavior. We are joined by Professor Sean Tu of West Virginia University College of Law, Sean is a nationally recognized expert on patent and drug law and has authored, authored over 50 publications on drug patent issues. His most recent article is on terminal disclaimers and patent thickets, which is very relevant to our discussion today. Lauren Aronson is the executive director of the Campaign for Sustainable Drug Pricing. The campaign is a broad-based coalition of leaders in healthcare, healthcare providers, consumers, health plans, and businesses promoting bipartisan, market-based solutions to lowering drug prices in America. Merith Basie is executive director of Patients for Affordable Drugs, an independent national patient organization focused exclusively on achieving policy changes to lower the price of prescription drugs. Sneha Dave, Executive Director of Generation pa Patient, is an organization she established to cr create support systems and resources for adolescents and young adults with chronic conditions across the U.S. and internationally. And of course, we've also heard from Jacqueline Garibe, who is a patient advocate with Patients for Affordable Drugs. So let's begin our panel discussion with some basics. Our first question is for Professor Tu. Can you explain how the patent system is supposed to work for prescription drugs? And can you explain what a patent thicket is and how they limit competition and increase prices for drugs? Yeah. Um, I wanted to first... Oh, I, 
I'm a law professor, so my voice kind of can carry normally without a microphone, but I have to use this. Uh, I want to first uh, express my gratitude to Senators Welsh, Welsh, Klobuchar, and Braun for the invitation to talk about this bill. Uh, this bill is an important uh, step and aimed at curbing patent gamesmanship uh, in the pharmaceutical field. Too often, as we just have heard, we hear stories about people having to make uh, choices between paying for their prescription medicines or uh, rationing uh, their medications to make ends meet or spending uh, their money on luxury items like rent or food, right? Uh, the, these problems really should not be facing citizens in the richest, most powerful country in the world. Uh, so the patent system uh, really is here to incentivize research and commercialization of dr drugs by giving uh, inventors a limited monopoly where they can charge a, a ton of money and make hefty products, um, but only for a limited time. Uh, this is important because the R&D process and commercialization process uh, is expensive. Uh, and without protection, it wouldn't be worth it for these companies to develop these new drugs that might only cost competitors a few cents uh, to copy. However, once the patent expires, um, capitalism is supposed to work its magic. Once we introduce competition, the prices of these drugs can drop sometimes by 90%. With competition, Patients can then get access to medicines that were once unavailable or only available to those who could afford hefty copays or private insurance. So the story is get your patents, come up with new drugs, get paid, and then once that patent expires, um, competition comes in and prices come down and we get affordable, accessible medicines. Uh, but unfortunately, for most drugs, that's not where the story ends. Brand manufacturers uh, have created new uh, ways to stop competition because once competition enters the market, prices take a nosedive. nosedive. Um, patent thickets are one important tool used by pharmaceutical companies to delay or deter the market entry of generics by increasing costs and increasing risks associated with bringing a generic to market. So what are patent thickets? Uh, patent thickets are just lots of patents to the same product. Um, brand manufacturers get patents to the tablet form, the capsule form, the liquid form, the extended release form. Uh, they, patent the way you manu oops, they patent the way you manufacture the drug uh, and how it can be used. What do I mean by how it can be used? Uh, use of the drug to treat really bad heart disease. Patent that. Uh, patent the way to treat it for people with moderate heart disease. Patent the way uh, you use it to treat patients with high cholesterol that may get heart disease. Uh, they even patent the safety protocols that are associated with these drugs. So you get the point. Uh, why are these thickets a problem? Well, generic manufacturers have to make sure they don't infringe any of these patents before they enter the market. Uh, and it's much riskier and much costlier to deal with 100, 150 patents than it is to deal with just one or two. So just like moving through a forest, it, it's much harder to get through a thicket than just a vine or two. Uh, patents, thickets here go against how the patent system is supposed to work uh, by extending monopolies without really enhancing innovation. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. That was a very um, helpful explanation. And I should note that if you have questions, please um, note, reserve them for the end. We should have a few minutes at the end for, for audience questions. So now I'll turn it over to Lauren and Merith, where I'd like to learn a little bit a little bit from them about how patent thickets impact prescription drug costs. Lauren, I understand the Campaign for Sustainable Drug Pricing has done some important research on the impact of patent thickets. How much are patent thickets costing patients in the healthcare system? Sky's the limit. I'd say is, is the short answer to the question. Thank you again, um, Andrea and Senator Welch, for, for inviting us to participate today. This topic is incredibly important, and as we're thinking about how to address the issue of prescription prices um, in the long term, both for consumers and patients, but really for you know, the greater healthcare system, dealing with patent abuse is really paramount to addressing these issues. Um, we have done a number of uh, research studies, but I will highlight others first, actually, because I think they're incredibly important. Um, the American Economic 
um, Liberties Institute, along with IMAC, has done a number of studies over the last several years showing that even just in 2019, patent thickets have cost um, consumers over $40 billion, and that is just in one year. Um, and so when we're thinking about what this means for, for the healthcare system and for consumers, I mean, literally, we're talking $40 billion in, in one year alone. It's really just astronomical and creates a huge disincentive um, for patients, as we heard, of trying to access their medications. Uh, we talked a lot about um, AbV um, and uh, their patent thicket strategy with Humira and Embril. Um, there have also been other studies done that highlight the fact that even on just those five um, drugs alone, two of those of the five that were noted, um, that cost about $16 billion in one year. Um, given the patent thickets that are associated with those drugs. So when we're thinking about $16 billion, just an order of magnitude, that's more than all of the revenue for NFL teams combined in one year. Um, so these, I, I, you can't underscore enough just how incredibly um, challenging it is for consumers and for patients um, to access these drugs given the patent thickets and how much it's costing us. Thank you, and that's all being borne by the consumers in the form of yes. higher health insurance premiums, higher out-of-pocket costs, and frankly, unaffordability, people going without their prescription drugs. Um, Merit, so that's a good segue. Based on your work with patients like Sneha and Jacqueline, what, would you, what have you learned about how high prescription drug prices impact patients, and what led your organization to endorse this legislation? Thank you. Almost one in three people in the United States of America cannot afford their prescription drugs, one in three. We at Patients for Affordable Drugs hear from people every single day from every single state, young people like our, our friends here who've already shared their stories, and people who are tired, people who are working, who are struggling with this issue just to thrive. And I should mention here that those people who are disproportionately impacted are our friends and neighbors from black and brown communities. There are also patients like uh, Sue Lee from Kentucky. She's in her 80s, and she shared with us that she thought, even though she had worked past retirement and saved as much as she possibly could, she was forced to stop taking Humira, the treatment that had finally treated her painful sores because it was gonna cost her over $8,000 in retirement. Stephen Hadfield from North Carolina shared with us he has a rare blood cancer, and he's on an expensive drug called uh, Brukinza, which has a list price of nearly $14,000 a month. There isn't a generic option, and he has no choice but to buy this medication, and he will not be able to retire as a result. So at P4AD, Patients for Affordable Drugs, we have over 34,000 patient stories, like the ones you've heard today, uh, that have been shared with us from all across the country. Brand name drug companies, as you've heard, really do abuse the patent system to prolong their monopolies, to set and raise prices at the expense of Americans. And this is why Americans are paying between three and up to eight times more for brand name drugs in this country. And it's why patent reform is necessary to curb patent abuse by greedy pharmaceutical corporations. Competition, I think, is important for a number of reasons. But as, as Sean mentioned, studies indicate that with six or more generic competitors, prices can plummet by more than 90%. 90% is huge. Patent reform bills, such as this one introduced um, by Senators Welsh and Klobuchar and Braun, are crucial for addressing anti-competitive pricing power of drug companies. And for too long, these big drug, drug companies have gamed the system to prevent less expensive, generic, and biosimilar drugs from entering the market. Americans really do deserve better. And more than nine in 10 voters here are concerned that anti-competitive patent abuse tactics used by pharmaceutical companies are a problem. At Patients for Affordable Drugs, not only do we represent patients, but we are also pushing for the passage of bipartisan legislation that will curb abuses of the patent system and get generics and biosimilars to market that will lower drug prices for all patients uh, on those medications. And key, much like uh, Sneha mentioned with generation patient, 
we also do not take money from the pharmaceutical industry or anyone who profits from the sale or distribution of, of uh, drugs in this country. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for um, sharing those really disturbing statistics that should just not be possible to hear that in the United States of America. And, you know, so grateful to the senator for introducing legislation to stop it. So let's um, dive into that legislation and better understand this, the solution and the mechanics that this uh, legislation addresses. Professor Tu, could you provide us with a practical example of how the legislation would reduce patent thicket gamesmanship? Yeah, so let me give you uh, just a short example of a thicket. Uh, and, and what I'm gonna describe is the thicket involving uh, restasis which is uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredient is cyclosporin A, used to treat uh, dry eye disease. There are, I'm gonna give you an example with uh, four patents, but there are many more patents in this thicket. So patent number one is the liquid form of restasis. Uh, patent number two is the method of increasing tear production by administering restasis. Uh, the third patent is treating dry eye disease uh, by administering restasis. And patent number four is treating keratoconjunctivitis sicca by administering restasis. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but the people I work with are doctors, uh, and they tell me that keratoconjunctivitis sicca is dry eye disease. All right, so uh, none of these patents are about innovation. Uh, they don't disclose anything new. Uh, they're, they're, they're created to uh, intimidate competitors. All right, fun fact, cyclosporin A was discovered in 1970, all right? Uh, I have no doubt that these patents uh, allowed Allergen here to charge monopoly prices for many extra years. Uh, another fun fact, uh, Restasis made $12 billion between 2014 and 2021. In 2021 alone, it made $1.3 billion. The next year, 2022, when uh, generic competitors were allowed on the market, revenues dropped to 621 million, so more than half uh, in one year. Uh, so they tried like heck to deter and delay competition. Why? Well, they had 1.3 billion reasons uh, in 2021. I note that Europe doesn't allow these type of thickets, and guess what? They get generic competition much earlier than we do. All this bill says is, hey, these patents look pretty much the same. Because these patents look the same, you should only bring one patent uh, instead of four or five and sometimes dozens or more to litigation. Bring your best patent to the fight. You don't need to bring all of them. <laughs> you just need to bring the one that you think is the best. Um, that will lower generic costs uh, and risks so that they can enter the market. What this bill attempts to do is stopping uh, drug manufacturers from unjustly extending their monopoly power. This bill doesn't discourage innovation, patenting, or even charging monopoly prices for drugs. It encourages competition while allowing innovators to make handsome profits for the duration that their patent is alive. Capitalism is what this bill is all about, allowing the market to work the way it should. It's about bringing much needed relief to patients who are suffering from disease uh, and having to make that choice between prescription drugs, rent, or food. And I think this bill is an important step in both protecting innovation while promoting competition uh, and capitalism. Thank you, Professor. And you're quite humble. You also have a PhD in pharmacology, so <laughs> you know your way around the drug system. Um, and you know, to your point on innovation, I, I think that this legislation actually incentivizes innovation because if drug companies can no longer spend their time and resources um, on, on phony patents, they'll have to actually focus on bringing new innovative drugs to market. Right. So there's a study that was done that uh, shows that uh, brand firms spend about 15 to 20 percent of their net revenues on R&D. They spend 30 percent on marketing. They spend another 30 percent on stock buybacks. They're, so they're almost double that amount for marketing the drug uh, versus R&D, which is what you would think that they would want to spend their money on. Right. Okay. Well, the next question is for Meredith. Clearly, this bill is an important element of addressing, of addressing patent abuses. Um, based on your experience in, in advocacy, what do you expect the pharmaceutical industry, the branded pharmaceutical industry, their reaction to be to this legislation? <laughs> um, 
we'd expect the pharmaceutical industry to make the same play that they've made for the last 60 years, which is to cry wolf on the argument of innovation. Every time they face regulation, it's like, boo-hoo, we're not going to be able to develop any drugs. And this industry has really tried to instill fear in, in the American public, in Americans, that federal legislation to rein in drug prices would actually threaten innovating, innovative life-saving drugs, and that's sim simply not true. There was a West Health policy that showed that large brand name drug manufacturers would still be the most profitable industry, even with a loss of one trillion, with a T, dollars in sales, all while maintaining current research investments. So uh, I should also note that pharmaceutical uh, companies and their sort of wolf crying conveniently ignores the fact that the National Institutes of Health is the single largest um, source of biomedical research in the entire world. Uh, with its budget of uh, $45 billion in 2022, and the fact that NIH contributed to research associated with all 356 drugs that were brought to market um, and approved by the FDA uh, between 2010 and 2019 uh, for a value of over $230 billion US dollars. So let's be clear. Uh, Bipartisan polling shows that American voters do not buy into farmers' arguments against drug price reform, as nearly 80% of Americans say that the pharmaceutical industry can live with slightly lower profits and still provide the innovation that patients need. We know that their primary concern is really protecting their profits, even at the expense of patients, and you already mentioned um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and we know that Big Pharma has already filed nine lawsuits to protect their profits uh, as a result of the introduction uh, of, of that uh, critical law. And we also know that this industry has a, uh, a long, a very long history of resorting to fear-mongering, as I mentioned. So we know that the industry does have plenty of money for innovation. Drug company stocks are doing just fine. The industry is full of cash and has plenty of access to capital. So anything that you expect to hear is not going to be something new, and it's also not something to be believed. That's exactly right. Um, Protect Our Care conducts quite a bit of public opinion research, and we find as well that the public doesn't believe it either, especially with their arguments related to innovation. My next questions are for Sneha and Jacqueline. Um, as patient advocates who need access to new cures, how will this bill benefit patients? I can definitely talk a little bit about that. Um, as someone with a condition that was previously listed as rare, um, I depend on new cures and hope for new cures and treatments every single year. There are currently only about eight medications that are approved by the FDA to treat AS, and I have already taken t five of them. So I am desperate for new medications, new cures, new treatments in order to hopefully one day live my life completely pain-free. And as Merit stated, we've seen these arguments with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act that pharmaceutical companies will say that they won't be able to afford innovation. But there have been new drugs that have come out. There have been increases in investment in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it's true, it's uh, proven that that's an absolutely false statement. Um, and as a patient myself, I feel very comfortable advocating for legislation such as this and still hoping for cures. Hi. Um, so I think, you know, to this question, I would answer the obvious, more timely access to biosimilars and generics. But I also think we have to use the word cure very carefully. Um, I think pharma PR teams are really great at using the hashtag fewer cures to really um, in some ways manipulate the patient community into believing that innovation and affordability are mutually exclusive. So um, I really think that patent reform, a huge part of that for me is to incentivize 
truly novel innovation that's not just, we're not just getting you know, therapeutics that are marginally beneficial. Um, and wanna highlight how grateful I am to research and for being able to have therapies to be on, but I think it's really important that we think about the patent system and we think about how can we encourage novel innovation and in actual cures because I have been promised every single five years for a cure and I've been waiting 18 years, so um, I, you know, I think it's important that we use the term cure very carefully, especially as it pertains to uh, innovation. Thank you. That's an excellent point. We're coming up on time, so I wanna make sure we have time for questions from the audience. Anyone like to ask a question? We've got a question in the back. I just thank you so much for being up here and, and, and doing what you do. I also want to thank the senator and, and his staff for really putting together an excellent bill that we have endorsed. Um, I just want to, you know, if you want a very real world example, um, I, I, and, and I'm going to ask a question off of this, and, and maybe Lauren might be the best person to take this one, but if you look at uh, cost plus drugs, um, this year, people don't realize it, so Humira is now available in a biosimilar as of this year. Cost Plus Drugs, which is, is Mark Cuban's company, just announced that they're gonna be selling it for $570 um, uh, as compared to the $4,400, you know, the, the $4,000 plus number over there. It's an over 80% reduction in the price of that drug. So this is like real, like this isn't like we're, like for years, those of us have been fighting this fight for years have been told we've been speculating and we don't really know and you know, oh, no, it's real. Pricing of Myra in the United States, a biosimilar that works just as well is now under $600, um, which is amazing. And, and people like Andrea and Lauren and, and Sean, who have been fighting this uh, fight for years, um, are responsible for that. So thank you. Um, and my question would be, you know, how do we look at, um, especially in the rare de disease community, which you just brought up, there are a lot of um, rare diseases where we're starting to see patent thickets develop, where there is only one drug on the market. So I look at um, Troprostanil, which is a product of United Therapeutics, uh, 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 a company, by the way, that's a public benefit corporation, gets special tax incentives under our tax code. Um, that drug is, they've set up a patent thicket on that drug. They've prevented competition, and it's a rare, it's a rare disease. It's not even a situation like a lot of the diseases that Humira creates, where there are eight, nine alternatives in the brand market. In this case, there's only one. So what are we doing around um, the, what does the bill do around the specific issues of rare diseases and, um, and patent thickets and that growing problem that we're seeing in that space? Well, thank you, um, and thank you for your comments. Um, speaking, I think, to the, the rare disease issue from a policy perspective, you're absolutely right that what we're seeing is there are a number of companies that are seeking the rare disease designation, which increases their exclusivity. Um, and one of the challenges, though, is that how do you maintain the integrity of, of the Orphan Drug Act, which we obviously need. It is so valuable, um, and it really is in, uh, an incredible incentive for the real small biotech companies that are doing the true innovative work here. The challenge, though, is how do you protect the integrity uh, of that, that incentive, while at the same time making sure it's not abused by the AbbVie's um, and other companies that will then buy up these smaller biotechs and their products and then create patent thickets beyond it. So your question is a great one. I think from, from our perspective, making sure that we're protecting the integrity of the Orphan Drug Act is critical, but also putting around some guardrails to ensure that it's not abused um, is critical from, from our perspective. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I, can I oh, chime into yes, that please. too? So what I love about this bill is that it doesn't matter who creates the thicket, right? It, it doesn't matter if it's an orphan drug or if it's a non-orphan drug. Um, and by the way, I, I have a paper that shows that orphan drugs actually make as much as non-orphan indication. So I can charge a million people one dollar or I can charge one person a million dollars. And that's exactly what these drug companies are doing. The, the profits that they might make off of orphan drugs are almost as much uh, non-significant to a P of 0 0.05, right, uh, uh, for these, these orphan drugs versus non-orphan drugs. We have an example right behind me. Rev, uh, 
uh, Revlimid is an orphan indication, right? Multiple myeloma, 200, almost like 120 patents on that, uh, on that drug. Uh, and, you know, the thickets that are created around orphan drugs are just as heavy and dense as non-orphan indications, and this bill will address all of them. Thank you all so very much for all the work you're doing. My name is Nancy, I'm in Senator Schatz's office. Um, my question is regarding when you brought up Restasis, this is a new indication for an old drug. And so they protected that with patents. And then there was another drug, Colchicine, where that is a very old drug and all of a sudden got a very high price. Is that the same patent issue or are there other issues that are increasing the prices on these new indications for old drugs? Professor, can you take that one? <laughs> right, so I, I'm not sure, like, is your question, like, are there incentives to have new indications for old active ingredients? Is that... Oh yeah, I'm that, uh, yeah. I'm, ha I'm happy to take that. Um, I'm not familiar with a specific example you noted, but I'd say that when you're thinking about the drug pricing problem, patent thickets are probably the biggest issue we are facing for sure, which is why this legislation is so important. Um, but to your question, there's also issues around product topping. Um, sometimes you'll see manufacturers bring a drug to market, um, and then they will then change um, one, some, one small piece of the drug itself and then they will relaunch it as another name. They will change the color. They will change how many hours the duration is for. And so they will then relaunch it, file additional patents, but it's called product hopping where you're going from one product, a minor modification, going to the next, and then they'll pull the older product from the market itself and it restarts the clock. And so when you see product hopping, it becomes much more challenging for one, for generic and biosimilar manufacturers to bring um, a lower cost alternative to market, but for patients and consumers, you're restarting from zero in terms of, of where they are in terms of their patent protections. Yeah, th this is but one of many strategies, but it is an important strategy that's uh, in involved in kind of delaying or deterring market competition. And I would just say there are a number of bills right now uh, in, in the Senate that will build on, on this bill as well uh, that focus on patent tickets. They're all bipartisan. Uh, pay for delay, product hopping, uh, transparency in generic applications as well, and sort of bringing the FDA and USPTO uh, closer together. Uh, and we, as Patients for Affordable Drugs, have endorsed all of those and are pushing for those as well at the same time. So I would encourage you to look at those as well. Thank you. And I'll just make one more final pitch on those slew of bills that Merrick noted all came out of the Senate Judiciary Committee on a bipartisan basis unanimously last year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for those questions, and unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you to the audience um, and to our panelists, and to Senator Welch, Klobuchar, and Braun for their leadership on this. Senator, do you have parting thoughts? Well, you know, I do. It, it's pretty uh, moving uh, to listen, uh, Sneha and Jacqueline, and all of you put this work in, because on healthcare, we're more concerned when it's somebody we love. And we'll do anything. You know, if you have savings, you'll spend it. If you have a home, you'll remortgage it. Uh, you'll do, you'll liquidate your pension fund. And there's a real cynicism by the pharma companies who essentially abuse the love we have for one another mm -hmm. to extract these incredible prices through extraordinary manipulative ways. You know, when you're talking about how you should be focusing on going to school, you should be focusing on your relationships with your friends and family, uh, every one of us wants to focus on building our better life. But we're all vulnerable. And there but for the grace of God go any one of us. So the fact that pharma, with the wonderful 
things that they can come up with, then degrade themselves by sticking it to people who are everyday people, your neighbor next door, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, uh, and it is legal for them to do the product copy, uh, to do the patent thickets, is outrageous, mm -hmm. totally outrageous and totally anti-competitive and totally against the market system that we have. So it's always been astonishing to me how so many of the bad things that are around us are legal. And our goal is to make these outrageous things that are ripping off consumers and creating a lot of heartache for families illegal and let the market do its work. So I'm inspired by everybody here uh, who sees that because I see what you're doing is not just about standing up to big pharma. It's about standing up for the relationships we want to have with one another to live a healthy life and help one another be healthy, prosperous, and generous. So thank you all very much.